Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I promise I uh, won't give you too many occasions to give me standing ovations. And at the State of the Union, I think I was up and down maybe 50 times. And my glutes were really hurting the next day. I turned to Secretary of, uh, of Defense, uh, Mark Esper, who was sitting next to me, and I said, are you breaking a sweat? And he said, sure. Yeah. <laughs> But it was a great speech. Uh, good morning, everyone, and, and uh, it's wonderful to, to be here with you uh, in Miami. Chief uh, Cass Stevens, I appreciate your kind introduction, and, and I thank you for your decades of service in uniform, first with the 101st Airborne Division and uh, then as a police officer in Illinois. Uh, and all of us are grateful for your leadership at IACP, which has been shaping and advancing uh, the police profession for, for uh, over a century. Um, when I was Attorney General the first time, which was over 25 years ago, uh, crime was at its peak, and I, and I felt the only way we could address this uh, was to work shoulder to shoulder, uh, our federal uh, law enforcement, shoulder to shoulder with our state and local colleagues, and that is what I put a premium on in those days and worked very hard to build those relationships and joint task forces and, uh, you know, uh, collaborating across the board on all the challenges we face. And when I've come back to the department, I think there have been times in the interim where those relationships were not as nurtured as they should have been, and it's certainly my highest priority to to build those relationships and, and continue this strong partnership. And I uh, value uh, our relationship with IACP, and I look forward to working hand in glove with IACP in the months ahead. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here today, and it's good to see my, my federal colleagues and the members of the commission uh, that we just established uh, here as well. Uh, and. Uh, I want to thank you all for focusing on this important problem of, uh, and challenge we face of officer wellness and safety. Uh, our shared objective is overcoming these challenges so that our more than 900,000 men and women in blue are best positioned to, to carry out their charge, which is serving and protecting the American people. And I want you to know that there is no higher priority uh, in this Department of Justice than the safety and security of the American people. And to meet that charge, we must have your back. Now, I'm confident that everyone agrees, everyone here today agrees, that this conference is, is not a minute too soon. Uh, there's no tougher job in America uh, than serving as a law enforcement officer. Uh, that was true in the past, and it's even truer today. As you know uh, better than anyone, uh, the trials of our country's law enforcement officer, uh, the trials that our, our law enforcement officers encounter on a daily basis are complex, difficult, frequently very dangerous, and wide-ranging. Some of the problems uh, that law enforcement officers confront have been around for a long time, while others are relatively new. And as I said, policing is a dangerous business. But the reality is that being a police officer is more difficult uh, than it's ever been before. Uh, one reason is the emergence of a deeply troubling attitude toward police uh, in some parts of our society. Far from respecting the men and women who put their lives on the line to protect us, uh, it is becoming common in some quarters to scapegoat uh, the police uh, and to disrespect police officers and disparage the vital role played uh, by law enforcement in our society. This undoubtedly makes the already difficult job of protecting the public even harder. Uh, these attacks against the police are not purely rhetorical. All too often they involve attacks that are physical. Uh, assault against police officers have jumped about 20 percent up to about 6,000 a year. 
in 2018, 106 officers died in the line of, in line of duty incidents, 11 of whom lost their lives in ambush attacks, uh, more than double the number of officers killed in such attacks the previous year. Last year, the number of officers who died in the line of duty uh, incidents rose to 134. Here in Florida, eight officers died in line of duty incidents in 2019, while two have already fallen this year. And I will now read their names and, and let us take a moment of silence afterward. Sergeant Stephen Greco, Lieutenant Daniel Hinton, Sergeant David Thompson, Sergeant Anthony Neary, Officer James Brown, Deputy Sheriff Benjamin Nimitz, Sergeant Tracy Vickers, Officer Ken Foley, Officer Paul Dunn, and Master Trooper Joseph Bullock. Thank you. The sacrifice of these heroes will not be forgotten and will continue to inspire us in, uh, as we work uh, to uh, build this profession and protect the safety of our law enforcement officers. Uh, one of the things that has distressed me in, in recent years has been this attitude that it's okay to resist police officers. A few decades ago, it was a big deal to resist a police officer, but now it seems to happen on a casual basis. One of the reasons we have laws against resisting police officers is precisely because these are dangerous situations which, as you all know, can escalate very quickly. The officer needs to be able to go home to his or her family that night and not be required to risk their lives at the But a lot of these laws are not being enforced.
We have a full employment economy right now. And when you combine this with the demands and sacrifices that are involved in policing, it's making attracting and keeping high caliber officers a nationwide challenge. Fewer people are applying for law enforcement jobs, and early exits and retirements are blocked. The number of sworn officers per capita has fallen over the last two decades. The average number of full-time sworn officers in relation to the number of uh, the U.S. residents was down 11% uh, between 1997 and 2016. Requiring law enforcement to do more with less obviously exacerbates the need to follow what I just described and adds to the stress that individual officers face on the job. Now, police officers, as you know, are at higher risk of suicide than any other profession. Some of you likely know that we lost, we just lost, another NYPD officer a few weeks ago. And in Florida, at least six officers lost their lives to suicide in 2019. And one officer has fallen to suicide this year. The rate of suicide among those in law enforcement and firefighting is 40% higher than the national average. Nearly one in four officers experiences thoughts of suicide at some point in their lives. At least 228 officers took their lives in 2019, a 44% increase from the previous year. Not only is that higher than the number of line of duty deaths, it reflects a steady increase in officer suicides over the past several years. And these are staggering statistics, and a lot more has to be done. Our men and women wear the badge of some of the country's strongest and bravest people, and like the rest of us, there are times in their lives where they, they need support. I talked to the Secretary of uh, HHS, Alex Azar, and they've been doing a very uh, deep study uh, of suicide among veterans and are amassing a lot of, of learning data. And I told them that I'd like to make sure that we uh, work together on this and that uh, the commission and the working group get, uh, are working for us on this issue, get the benefit of their thoughts and learning. There's a lot of overlap because so many of our officers are veterans. And I think it would be very helpful to study their findings. You know, military veterans and police are, are very strong and brave people and frequently are reluctant to come forward and seek help when they're facing difficulties. And I think well, there are probably many reasons that underlie the suicide. Problem. I think this is one of them. Just a lot of to come forward because you view yourself as a, or, or people in law enforcement and veterans, you know, view themselves as not really needing that help or support, but everyone goes through a period where they have some, have some difficulty and need to support. You know, from my own experience a few years ago, you know, my oldest daughter was having a very scary form of cancer. We uh, had lost him for treatment. And uh, in addition to the various priests I had hanging around, uh, the hospital assigned a social worker to us, and she came into the room and said, I am the social worker. And my immediate impulse was, hey, we're, we're smart, and we don't need a social worker. <coughs> She was one of the greatest things that happened to us during this six month period where we were up in Boston. We become very close friends of failing her, and she was just not us. And that, you know, that knee jerk reaction I had at the time was, you know, he's a social worker. He was a good thing for us. And uh, so I understand the instinct to uh, say that we don't need to have it. But that's one of the things that I think we have to work on overcoming. 
Because we have a moral obligation to all we can to support the men and women that keep us safe. Fortunately, uh, there's been real recognition of this, and citizens have stepped up to make a difference. Earlier this month, Officer Sean Weinman, uh, hailing from the Tallahassee Police Department, was recognized with a Back the Blue Award for his efforts to raise awareness about suicide and deliver mental health training to our police. Now, the challenge to policing and the rule of law widely and seriously impacts our, our country's law enforcement community. And to counteract and surmount them, we must not only acknowledge the challenges, but work together to address their effects head on. And to ensure the safety and well-being of our officers, President Trump directed me to establish the Commission on Law Enforcement and the Administration of Justice. I think you know that the police have no greater champion uh, than President Trump. During uh, his third State of the Union, he stressed, as he has many times before, uh, that we as a nation need to support the men and women of law enforcement at every level. And I'm proud to serve in an administration that is so strongly and unapologetically supportive of the police. Now, President Trump recognizes that officer suicide is unacceptable and has taken steps to, to address it. In July, he signed into law the Bipartisan Stoic Act, which authorizes funding for mental health and suicide prevention services geared toward law enforcement. Three months later, he signed the executive order creating the Commission on the IACP Conference, and he signed it at the IACP Conference and, and Exposition in Chicago. Just last month, we at the department at our headquarters in D.C. had the privilege of announcing the formal establishment of the commission, the first of its kind uh, in criminal justice in half a century. The uh, commission will comprehensively assess the most pressing issues confronting law enforcement. And while we're focusing right now on the issue of, of safety and wellness, I think you all know that there are a variety of working groups where we're uh, working together on a, on a broad range of issues uh, of concern to law enforcement at all levels. We look forward to continuing that work, and we're really happy with the progress uh, that is being made and the commitment and enthusiasm of the commissioners. And I've heard from so many police uh, leaders around the country their desire to participate on various uh, working groups and provide uh, support to your efforts. It should go without saying that officer safety and wellness is also a pr priority, a big priority of this department. And in 2019, the Bureau of Justice Statistics awarded $15 million under its Valor and National Officer Safety Initiatives to address some of these issues. And BJA has also provided nearly 4,000 trainings under Valor to more than 124,000 law enforcement officers to improve safety, resilience, and well-being. And BJA's Safe Leo program is providing training, technical assistance, and resources to law enforcement uh, and their families to help prevent law enforcement suicide. Further, the department's National Institute of Justice has developed a strategic uh, plan dedicated to safety, health, and well wellness research. It awarded more than $2 million to support this research uh, in 2018 and, and has increased it to $3 million this year. It's imperative uh, that state and local jurisdictions not skimp on investing in law enforcement. Uh, we have to get back to basics. The basic and primary function of government is to protect the safety of its citizens. And law enforcement can't be an afterthought when it comes around to providing the resources to do that. It has to be first in line and it has to be fully and adequately funded before other resources are deployed. Uh, uh, 
Now, money is critical, but government can only do so much, and I think the support for American law enforcement uh, needs to come from the American people, too. At a minimum, support means that we as individuals lend officers uh, an extra amount of goodwill for having chosen a life of difficult public service and frequent personal risk. You know, I've said it before that during the Vietnam War, uh, you know, people spat upon our soldiers. There was a lack of respect for our, uh, men and women in uniform who were uh, fighting on our behalf. And people eventually saw that and they came around and I'm glad that today people do give respect and recognize the service of those in uniform who are fighting our, you know, our foreign enemies. And it's good to see. Uh, but I think we need the same epiphany in society for those who are manning the ramparts here at home and making the same sacrifice and facing the same kinds of dangers. And in many ways, I've said this before, it's a, it's, it, foreign wars usually come to an end, and fortunately we're trying to bring, bring some of them to an end right now. But the, the battle that law enforcement fights never comes to an end. It's constant. It, there, there, there's never a final victory in the si signing of a peace treaty. It's constant. And that takes a special kind of courage and a special kind of sacrifice to, to wage. And I think uh, when, when uh, the American people reflect on this, I think they have to start giving police officers and the profession the respect and support it deserves. Uh, now, while policing is demanding, it's also uniquely rewarding. Uh, it is one of the country's highest callings, and we are fortunate that so many men and women of character are willing to serve selflessly so that their fellow citizens can live securely. And we owe them all the support and services they need to work their way through the stresses and problems that their service brings about. So when the President signed the executive or order forming the commission, he pledged, we want to take care of our law enforcement officers. And today's conference and your participation in it comprise a sincere and enthusiastic endorsement of that goal. So thank you so much uh, for sharing your time this morning and for taking on this important work. God bless you. God bless the United States. Thank you very much.